Hello and welcome back to the TMDSAS podcast. I'm Enrique, the coordinator of research, advising services, and digital media at the TMDSAS office in Austin, Texas. With this series, we hope to close the gap for non-traditional applicants by connecting our listeners with advisors and admissions officers that address topics that will apply not just to non-traditional applicants, but to all applicants. We're continuing the non-traditional applicant series of the TMDSAS podcast today with two advisors from UT Dallas that work with Dr. Karen Delivares, uh, and you can hear her discussion about non-traditional applicants in episode 25 of the podcast. Uh, these two advisors, Mr. Doyen Rainey and Ms. Shirley Anderson, are actually really involved with advising non-traditional applicants. And so we thought that they would make a great addition to this podcast. And this discussion will cover several topics that are relevant to non-traditional applicants, such as applying to post programs or even thinking about master's programs. Uh, and in addition to that, we touch on the subject of how to help non-traditional applicants shape their experiences so that they're more directly applicable to a career in medicine, dentistry, or veterinary medicine. This episode was actually recorded at a conference for Advisors for the Health Professions in Charleston, South Carolina. Let's have a listen bunch of Texans and we had to come to South Carolina to sit down together. <laughs> well, uh, we want to get to know a bit better. So, uh, Ms. Anderson, would you mind telling us a little bit more about uh, where you got started as an advisor and what called you to advising? Sure. So, um, after graduation, um, I joined high school college advising uh, back in Houston, Texas. So, that's really how I got into advising in general. I loved it um, and eventually got my master's in higher education. Then one thing led to another and here I am in this office. Um, And I've been loving this job ever since. It's wonderful to be able to work with diverse students towards health professions. Awesome. Ms. Rainey? Well, I I had kind of an oddball approach in that I was a a literature and psychology major as an undergrad, Mm -hmm. um, concentrating in helping people to understand stories and and both the stories that we tell each other about uh, the world and the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and and how we interact with others. Um, So I went from that education into teaching high school um, taught high school English, history, and psychology for several years, and uh, and then when I unexpectedly lost the teaching job and found myself back in the job market, I ended up over at UT Dallas and kind of stumbled into something that, um, that I enjoy very much, and it turns out to be still a lot of helping people to understand their stories. Absolutely. And the advising world, you know, we try to bring out the best in students so that they can shine through in their application. So it very much aligns with the teaching background uh, and with the coaching background. Uh, so uh, just to get, get this question out of the way, we've been talking to some of the admissions deans throughout the state and letting them identify a common myth in admissions and then giving us the correct advice for it. Do you guys have a common myth that students come to you about? Yes, I think um, earlier on in their undergrad career, I, the one I hear the most is, I'm about to get anything B or lower, is this going to completely kill my chances of getting into professional school, mm-hmm. usually medical or dental? Um, and we're, we're typically able to get over that myth pretty quickly once we look at other um, other experiences that they can offer, other ways to come out of that academic climb, um, and solutions to get through the rest of their undergrad or to plan for post undergrad um, uh, experiences. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the one that I hear most, and, and it seems to be almost universal among the incoming freshmen, is that only GPA and MCAT matter, and then you have to have a more nuanced discussion about why you might want your doctor to have traits other than book learning and test taking and, uh, and why it's important for the medical schools to look for some of those other traits as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we have graphics and rubrics to talk through all these things with yeah. students. With. Yeah, and it, um, I believe it was one, one of the conferences that we'd, went, we'd, uh, we'd gone to where one of the admissions deans actually said, you know, you never walk into your doctor's office and ask, hey, what was your MCAT score? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. there, there are a lot of... Uh, 
non-academic aspects of medical preparation that go into education. So I'm curious. I, I might start doing that just to set my doctors <laughs> on edge. I'm sure they, they. I'm sure they still remember the MCAT is, is quite traumatizing for a lot of students. We actually picked you two because uh, we know that you work a lot with some non-traditional students, uh, and as part of our non-traditional uh, students podcast segment, uh, we wanted to discuss a couple of topics with you. So, um, Ms. Anderson, would you mind uh, kind of guiding us through what happens when a non-traditional applicant comes to your door and uh, kind of starts inquiring about uh, pursuing a career in medicine. Yeah, so we see usually two populations of students that um, are non-traditional in the sense that they're post-bac. Um, there's a whole other category of students who could be non-traditional and still completing their undergrad. Mm -hmm. So as far as post-bacs go, um, if you're typically a record improver, sometimes I'll see you by your senior year of finishing your undergrad career. You already have an idea that more coursework needs to be done to be able to be competitive. Um, and if you're a complete career changer, then that's a very different track that I would recommend for you. So here at UT Dallas, um, there's three ways in which you could do post back work. One's through our formal certificate in biomedical sciences program, second degree seeking or non-degree seeking. All three are undergrad tracks, but then if it's a UT Dallas student looking for post bac work, then even some master's programs nearby that are uh, related in coursework would also be a good fit. Well, Ms. Anderson mentioned the, the two basic populations, the career improver um, or the, uh, the career changer. Um, for the career improver, someone with maybe a lower GPA or MCAT score who's trying to build up a stronger record, um, the first question I usually ask is, what's going to change now such that going forward is going to be dramatically different performance than in the past? And I think that until you have a strong and, and clear answer to that question, then there's not necessarily any point in continuing to take college classes and things like that, um, if it's just going to be more of the same. Um, a lot of times students understand pretty quickly when you say, because if we're getting A's from this point forward, then there's a point in, in this whole project. If it's going to be more B's and C's, that's getting you further away from medical school instead of closer. Mm -hmm. um, now, the career changer, so somebody who's, you know, they're a successful lawyer or EMT yeah. or, you know, paramedic, player. football player, chef, whatever, um, and have decided for whatever reason they now want to go into medicine. A lot of times that's a, a person who, based on their professional experience, will already have time management skills and study skills and motivation in spades. A lot of times, by the time they get to our office, they've already made a significant life commitment toward this new path, and they are ready to buckle down and, and succeed, and are very likely to. Um, the advising is different for them, though, in that they're frequently starting from the beginning of a science chain. So they're not looking for just upper division courses, and the conversation is based on how are we going to perform in these courses. They're looking for from the ground up, and then they'll figure out how to perform. Yeah. I'd like to um, double down on what Mr. Rainey was saying in terms of those that tend to be really successful during their non-traditional post-bac years are the ones who have thought this through very seriously. They took that time to decide, you know what, I did take a break. I went to work for a couple of years after graduating. I know for sure this is what I want. Those students tend to be the ones who come into class, they're ready. They don't care how awkward office hours are with professors. They know that they're here to get the job done. Yeah, and I think that's a a very key difference between a traditional applicant and a non-traditional applicant is uh, the wealth of life experiences that they come with Absolutely. Uh, to the table is, it, I mean, in a, in a lot of cases, um, a, lot, well, a lot of times applicants don't recognize that all of those experiences really play a part in medicine or in dentistry or, or in veterinary medicine. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you get students to kind of focus all of these different experiences and ideas mm -hmm. into uh, communicating, 
marketing themselves to these admissions committees and uh, focusing that message through their activities and their volunteerism uh, and their essays. I know we gave a list of examples of different careers that maybe we have seen. Uh, one that I would really like to add is being a parent. Um, some of our students take time off to be a parent or maybe work and be a parent, and now they're ready to come back. Um, so in those combinations, I think moms, dads, they know how to manage their children's schedules. They have an idea of you know, when do I need to be in class, when do I need to study, and so forth. Mm -hmm. One thing I do recommend to my students is to introduce themselves to the professors mm -hmm. um, close to the beginning of the semester, kind of let them know who they are. If they are a post-bac student or a part of our post-bac program, just give them a heads up. It couldn't hurt uh, to, to leave that door open for more conversations. And usually what ends up happening is it's, it's a really interesting story, how they ended up here. The professor gets to understand their situation. And even further than that, um, their stories need to go into their personal statements. And my, in, uh, that's my advice. Um, a lot of times the personal statement tells how they even got here. Mm -hmm. And yes, if you're claiming this is the year I had an epiphany and I came back, your grades should be able to line up with that and justify that you know, you deserve this. You have done the work to um, be able to keep up with the other professional students. Absolutely. So just to be clear, you know, every student, whether they're, they're non-traditional or not, has a story. They've all got influences and, and you know, the things that they've read and seen that, that make up how they see the world and all that kind of stuff. And every student has to put that down in the, the medical application essays. So the, the task before the non-traditional student is the same task that's before everybody, is, is you're going to talk about how you're approaching medicine based on your experiences. Yeah. Now, frequently, they're just going to have more interesting essays because they've got more experiences to draw on. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I know that our traditional students sometimes feel uh, that they're under the shadow of the interesting experiences that their non-traditional you know, competitors have had, and you know, they come to me and say, "How can I possibly write an interesting personal statement if I haven't been, you know, around the world and yeah. doing all these fascinating things?" And um, uh, and vice versa, the yeah. traditional students might, or, or the non-traditional students might feel like they didn't have a seamless three years and then apply to professional school. So I think we really see both ends. Yeah. So everybody's got a story, and nobody's confident that it's the right story, <laughs> right. but the it's the one you yeah. got, so you got mm -hmm. to just write it genuinely, and I think that if it's sincere and well-organized and on prompt, then you really you know, can't go wrong. The, the realm of effective application essays is a very large realm. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. And, you know, when, we, when we're talking about thousands of applicants every year, Somebody's bound to have a very similar trajectory uh, to your own, right? But it's you know who you are as a person, how you play out, how you present yourself in your application that really makes you stand out. Uh, well, uh, before we let you go, uh, I actually want to ask you a, a question about uh, what resources you offer uh, the students that you advise. Do you have any books that you'd like to uh, share with them? Uh, if you wouldn't mind telling us what they are. Well, uh, it really depends on what the student's interested in. Um, so for students with a particular interest in surgery and the, the manual side of medicine, I think Atul Gawande's book, Complications, is an excellent read and, uh, and fascinating. Um, the, uh, the Oliver Sacks books are are compelling and, uh, and very human approaches to neuroscience for students who are into the, the mental health or brain health. Um, for students interested in emergency medicine, uh, we hear good reviews about uh, just here trying to save a few lives. Um, and I can't remember the doctor who writes it, but she's an ER physician. And uh, uh, just compelling day-to-day -day real stories of what goes on in the ER. Um, uh, for students more interested in the managerial and administrative parts of medicine, um, 
uh, Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto, uh, I think gives a nice introduction to why the systemic approaches to medicine are important and why they, how they impact patient care. Mm -hmm. um, so, all good choices. Definitely. I think the favorite that I read this past year uh, that I would like to share with my students is also a tool Gawande, but uh, it's Being Mortal, and it really touches up on geriatrics, nursing homes. It's also a very personal story. Um, I think it's very relatable to a lot of students. Um, and as far as resources that I want to end off for non-traditional students, no matter which institution you decide to re-enroll in or um, advisors that you seek out, really find out, okay, I'm at this institution, what do they offer their typical undergrad students anyway? So whether that be the writing center, success center, tutoring center, um, you are probably going to be enrolled in classes with much younger students typically. So to also to uh, find a support network. So at UT Dallas, we have a post-bac pre-health society. It's not necessarily just medical, uh, dental students. We have PA, nursing, pharmacy, so you name it. Um, finding people who are in similar situations with you makes this seem so much more feasible. Yeah. Um, and finding cheerleaders to support this goal, because it can happen if you really dedicate the time to it. Absolutely. Great advice there. Um, the, uh, uh, I would also add that the, uh, you know, as important as it is to see a advisor <laughs> um, for an individualized, you know, very personal path into medicine, it's even more important for the non-traditional student because they have a, uh, uh, a more unique set of advantages and disadvantages in their pockets when they come to this path. Um, so, um, you know, there's... Absolutely critical that they try to work with a, a professional advisor um, and make sure that they're investing in activities that cover any weaknesses they might have from before um, and helping to expand upon their previous strengths. Definitely. All right, well, uh, Ms. Ray and Ms. Anderson, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to the TMDSAS podcast. Follow us at facebook.com slash TMDSAS, on Twitter at TMDSAS, and at TMDSAS support. And send us your questions or comments about the podcast at podcast at TMDSAS.com. We look forward to continuing to support our applicants with these resources and support to help you shine through in your application. On behalf of TMDSAS, once again, we want to wish all of our applicants for this application cycle all the best of luck. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later.